Hi, Jason from Smarter Marks again, and today I'd like to talk about assessment statistics. To understand assessment statistics, we first have to think about what makes an assessment a good one. There are two things any good assessment must do. First, it must reflect students' varied levels of understanding, giving students with both strong and weak understandings of the material an opportunity to demonstrate what they know and to learn from their results. Second, it must be fair. Students' performance on each question should reflect their level of understanding for the corresponding material, rather than language difficulties or random chance, for example. These two requirements are reflected in the difficulty and discrimination of assessment items. Let's take a closer look at each. The choice of item difficulty is often misunderstood to be about what we want the average mark to be, or what students want the average mark to be. In fact, it relates to the information that an assessment can give. To understand how, consider this photo. Because of the photographer's choice of exposure time, we can see many details for objects in the room. Through the windows, however, the photo is overexposed and we see little. With a different choice of exposure time, we can arrange to see details for what's outside, but now the photo is underexposed for objects in the room. Worse, rescaling by adjusting the brightness of the photo doesn't fix this problem. Instead, areas that were under or overexposed originally become noisy, like on the wall here, for example. Similarly, assessments that are too difficult or too easy will have score distributions like those shown on the left and right here for a four choice, multiple choice test. Tests like these tell us very little about each student's understanding that we didn't know already. The useful feedback students and teachers get from an assessment is maximized when the difficulty is about halfway between these, and in fact, a little further from the too hard distribution, which has some spread to it. From this, we can calculate an ideal difficulty for any type of question. Here, I've calculated ideal difficulties for some common question types. An assessment built entirely from four choice, multiple choice questions, for example, should have an average near 73% much lower or higher, and students and teachers are getting less meaningful feedback from the assessment than they otherwise could. Notice that this places restrictions on the kinds of material we can test with each question type, too. If we test difficult material with a true-false test, for example, it will become impossible to tell the difference between students who had an average level of understanding and those who had little understanding but were even moderately lucky with their answers. One more thing. Pass-fail exams, qualification exams for instance, are strongest when all questions are of the ideal difficulty, but this isn't the case for a typical classroom assessment. In the classroom, we want to do more than determine whether students have achieved a desired level of understanding. We'd also like to help our weaker students discover any strengths they can build on, and help our stronger students identify areas for growth. Returning to our photography analogy, what we'd really like is to see the details outside the apartment, while at the same time capturing what's inside as well and we can do that using HDR, or High Dynamic Range Photography. In HDR photography, images with low, medium, and high exposure times are combined to give a single image that better represents what a person would see if they were there. Similarly, when we're building classroom assessments, it can be helpful to include some basic questions and some difficult problems, though most items should still be near the ideal difficulty for the type of question used. The second statistic we're going to look at is item discrimination. To understand discrimination, consider these two questions that we might put on a Canadian geography test. The first question is an easy geography question, and we'd expect a class to do quite well on it. The second question is the same easy question, but written in Esperanto. A typical Canadian class will do terribly on this one, not because it's a difficult question, but because they don't understand the language it's written in. So how can we tell whether our students are understanding our questions? Suppose we knew the ability of our students in the subject we're assessing. If we plotted the score each student gets on a single question against their ability in the subject, questions with good item discrimination would produce graphs like these. We're going to ignore the slope and intercept of these graphs, which are related to the item difficulty and the question type, and focus instead on the fact that in both graphs, students with higher ability generally score better on the question. In a science class, we'd say the correlation is good, or that both graphs have a high r squared. For the question written in Esperanto, the graph might look more like this. Whether or not a student knows Canadian geography has no bearing on their ability to answer the question. The two are not correlated at all. Even worse would be a graph like this, in which our stronger students are actually doing worse on the question. In practice, we don't know students' abilities in advance, but we can compare their score on each question against their score on the test as a whole, and this is how we estimate discrimination. 
discrimination of less than about 0.1, and especially negative discrimination, suggests that a question needs to be re-examined. Several problems can lead to poor item discrimination. When we spot a question with poor discrimination, the first thing we should do is to check its difficulty. Problems which only a few students got right, or which only a few students got wrong, can have discriminations that are very sensitive to how well those few students did on the rest of the assessment. For these questions, it's probably best to ignore discrimination altogether. For problems with a difficulty between about 30% and 70%, low discrimination is more meaningful, and generally suggests one of two things. The first possibility is that we've miskeyed the question. If we've checked the key, though, the problem is likely due to confusing or misleading language, or the use of a complex question format. The teacher report generated by SmarterMarks begins with an easy-to-read graphical summary of the score distribution, difficulties, and discriminations for the assessment. Here, difficulties and discriminations are rescaled to make it easier to identify problems. In this assessment, we have a good distribution of difficulties and excellent discriminations. Further down, the item analysis gives the average and discrimination for each question, with questions identified by section and question number. For example, the first row is for question 6 in the second section. This summary can help you identify not only questions with poor discrimination, for example, this question which has a moderate difficulty but low or negative discrimination, but also other trends. For example, the responses to this question suggest that students hold a common misconception, choosing A where the correct answer is B, rather than simply not being sure of the answer. In future videos, we'll take a closer look at the item analysis and talk about some specific examples of how you can use the information in the teacher reports to improve your assessments. When those videos are available, you'll see links to the left here. Thanks for watching!